All right, I can start to see something on Twitch. Oh. Hey everybody, it looks like uh, we're getting started on Twitch here, but I think we're having a little difficulty with YouTube. Andy, do you see, uh, Andy or Holiday, are you seeing YouTube uh, working yet? Yeah, YouTube has started. It is? Oh, there we go. Okay, finally. I'm uh, muted on those channels though, so I don't know if the audio is coming through. No, you should be fine. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, hey everybody, tell us in the chat if... Uh, you can hear us all right. Um, and then also introduce yourselves. We want to see who is here, uh, where, where you're watching from. Just want to get a sense for what's what's going on, and we'll introduce ourselves in a second. Um, yeah, so let us know uh, if all the sound and everything is good in the chat, will, will you please, our lovely viewers. Dungeon bot, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dungeon bot. All right. So, hey everybody. My name is Jordan Harrison. Uh, with me, we have. Holland alum, Andy Scarpelli, Adam Thompson, and our special guest, Aaron Engelhart. Um, we are, so the first four of those people, um, we are Chi Town Bio. Um, we are a part of the DIY community biology movement, and we are 501c3 with a goal of opening a laboratory in Chicago where people can come and experiment with biotechnology. But it's during COVID right now, so we can't really do that at the moment. Um, so we've been trying to reach people with video games, and today we are playing Kerbal Space Program. Um, and we're here to talk with uh, Dr. Aaron Engelhart, who is studies astrobiology. He is an assistant professor at the in the Department of Genetic Cell Biology and Development at the University of Minnesota. And his lab studies the roles that nucleic acids could play in the emergence of life the emergence of life on other worlds, and the development of artificial life. So, uh, Aaron, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. This will be fun. Um, also, everyone, like, the other uh, three of you say, like, your voices. Oh, it just, okay. Well, this is, this is Andy uh, for when I'm talking. Generic voice. Hey everybody, this is Khaled here from Shy Town Bio. Super excited to have Aaron Engelhart on this uh, live stream with us. I've been a fan of his work for many years. I think we share a passion for the greatest molecule, RNA. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry, I don't I don't know if that came though. That was a little too loud. Sorry, I thought it was <laughs> I also like how you showed me up, Khaled, and just made yourself sound gracious and whatever while I sound awkward. That's cool. I'm cool with that. I, I try my best. Uh, and then we have Adam, who I forgot to put. I did not realize you were joining us until now, Adam, and I did not put your photo up on the um, on the uh, in the in the stream. So sorry about that. Uh, but Adam is there. Imagine what he looks like. Just however you want. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jordan. No and worries. Find you're a dinosaur right now. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So today we're playing Kerbal Space Program. So uh, here we are in the game. If you don't know what Kerbal Space Program is, 
It's basically a space simulation game where you are these uh, little green aliens uh, trying to go to space, and you can do a lot of different things. You have here the vehicle assembly building. You can build your rockets. Um, you can even build space planes and fly them, fly them around. You got a launch pad. You can track your uh, spacecraft at the tracking station. R and D. So we're. Uh, I am. Don't at me. I'm playing the uh, the sandbox version of this game. Because uh, I find it very difficult, and I'm just trying to have a good time here. So, uh, be easy on me. I'm just, I don't know how Kerbal Space Program players are if they, like, get mad at you if you play on Sandbox. But I am playing on Sandbox. Hey, Aaron, have, do you have any experience with uh, this game, or are you a gamer in general? I would say it, about as casually as you can possibly be and, and claim to be a gamer. That the, I think the one game I've played during lockdown was um, I downloaded a pandemic simulator and I was playing that a few weekends ago. <laughs> because, uh, we've been doing that. Um, but uh, is, no. is, does, it, does that not cause a ton of anxiety that when seems you've like conquered the, the world? That seems like the worst thing to be playing right now. Right. Yeah. I, I choose to roll with it, so and, uh, it, it, it's kind of fun because it's funny if you think about COVID. It's almost like they have everything dialed in for a, you know perfect pandemic. It affects people; they're asymptomatic for a while, and, and uh, it's morbid for sure. But and, uh, I remember I played that game back when I was a postdoc about five six years ago, and I remember thinking about like the different dials that you could adjust to to, to have it work. And it's almost like COVID is perfect for that. So yeah, absolutely, it, 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 it's morbid and uh, kind of horrifying, but yeah, um, I, I guess you could kind of choose to play the game or be horrified about it. Was, was the game, was it Plague? So the one I downloaded, I'll look on my phone, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't think it was Plague. There was one that I couldn't find anymore that I had that was, you know, Android games have changed so much in the last five or six years or so. And, yeah. Uh, I, I forget if it was, it, the, I think this was a successor to Plague Inc. I think is one you described, and the one that I played before was the successor to that. But yeah, you had these different dials that you could turn about the the organism and how it affected people. And I remember thinking that you guys were learning more about this. Like, COVID really nailed it, and, um, and it's it's terrible. But and, uh, you can imagine if someone was playing the game, you couldn't really come up with something that would be more successful than it is, which is why we're on uh, YouTube right now on Twitch. So are you a, a, a DNA or an RNA virus kind of a guy? <laughs> I don't know that I take a position either way. I, you know, lately everyone's thinking RNA because of COVID. And obviously, as you alluded to, RNA is definitely the superior of the two polymers, and <laughs> of all biopolymers, really. But um, yeah, lately, obviously, everyone's thinking about COVID lately and how their, their research can help with that. Um, so and, uh, we're, we're, uh, we always think RNA first and even more lately. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan, you want to take take us back uh, into Kerbal Space Program? Sorry for the uh, digression there. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, so basically, Kerbal Space Program, you, you can go to the... Well, not to the stars. I don't know what the limit of how far in the solar in the Kerbal solar system, which is not exactly the same as the like our solar system, uh, but there's a lot of like similarities. So you can go to the moon, which is spelled M-U-N, or you can go to Minmus, which is the other moon, and I forget which the Mars equivalent is. Um, you can build space stations, you can fly space planes, you can do some docking at a space station, which is what I'm going to try to do today, which is very, very hard. Um, which I did. Watch which I you do. We're, we're gonna watch me do it and watch me like squirm and like be very uncomfortable and like probably fail many times uh, but we're gonna talk about astrobiology while we do that and sort of talk about what the origin of life on earth looked like and what life might look like elsewhere in the solar system as well if it has ever existed there and I think there's a lot of great places to start with this conversation with but I think let's start in the vehicle assembly building uh, and I'm going to show you a rocket I'm working on and some of, let's see. Oh, okay. We moved. I, Sorry, I'm watching all of this happen in real time. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find out about Kerbal? Just so that we have a little bit of background. 
Uh, How did but... I find out about it? Yeah, so is this uh, just that so we can fill in the both gaps? We'll go from what's the game? You've already talked a little bit about the game. This is approximating Earth. Um, and so this is really uh, playing with physics more than it is with biology initially, right? It is. It's very like much an orbital mechanics simulator, but we can talk about how biology could play a role in um, in space travel. And in fact, I've also in this game installed a mod called Kerbalism, which mm -hmm. uh, includes a lot more science and life support um, aspects to the game that are in the base game. So in the base game, you don't actually like die if you run out of food or air or water. Uh, but that uh, functionality is now in this game thanks to the Kerbalism mod. So you can see uh, there's some stuff about that here, which will show up in a second. Um, mm -hmm. It'll tell you how much food you, you need and or food you have and how much water you have and oxygen. There's even a psychological component. So if your Kerbals are too stressed, they will break it down psychologically, and that can have disastrous uh, consequences for the mission. Uh, and so there's a lot of... So this mod, I think, incorporates a little more of the biology into um, into, into this game. But um, something else we can talk about is the science that you bring up to do on a space station. So Kerbal Space Program has some ridiculous... Uh, ideas of what's of those things to do so you can uh, there's one that's sort of like or it's pretty silly a gravioli detector which is not a real thing um, and uh, I had gravioli for your dinner three nights ago I don't know what you're talking about gravioli gravioli mm -hmm. gravioli give me the formula -oly. I have no uh, idea what you just said <laughs> that's a meme did you not know the Spongebob meme no okay I'm an old man. We have like different meme references. Anyway, and then there's... Yeah, I was going to say, Andy, you had a weird meme in our Slack the other day that maybe it's not <laughs> too appropriate to talk Let's about. Leave that one alone. Let's leave that one alone. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a fluid spectrovariometer. That's, it also says that that's not a real science. Um, but so, Aaron, you have done some research and actually sent up an experiment to a sounding rocket. Um, through NASA, and I, you've told me that you're also um, uh, working on getting us uh, an experiment up to the International Space Station. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And um, so, I guess first I'll talk about the sounding rocket program. Uh, so, this was a really gifted group of uh, interns at a number of NASA sites that was working on a payload, basically, for one of these sounding rockets that you mentioned. So first, what's a sounding rocket? Well, and, um, every instrument that you send into space has something called a TRL or technology readiness level. And one of the things that you do to uh, basically level up, I guess, with your TRL would be to do something like one of these sounding rocket missions. Because when we're thinking about space exploration, um, you know, you obviously want to make sure that you have everything right or as right as you possibly can. And so one of the things that you do in the course of ultimately sending something up to space is putting it on one of these sounding rockets. So what the sounding rocket does is it takes your payload, uh, it launches it up to, to space, but to suborbital space flight, uh, and then it comes back down. And hopefully everything goes well, and you recover your payload, you learn some stuff from that, and that's how you go into the other thing. And See, so this team interns, go ahead. I was going to say, so that would actually be probably one of the first things you would, if you were playing the career mode of Kerbal Space Program, where you actually had to start from nothing, would it be built to build something like a sounding rocket. But I started with a sandbox mode, and so I have all the pieces and can do whatever I want. But that's one of the first things that you would do in this game, would be to go to a suborbital launch and then just come back down. So I'm, I'm curious, Aaron, like, how do you even get to that stage? Is it just uh, you know knowing and interacting with folks that are involved with NASA missions? Yep, so yeah, the, as with everything, as you can imagine, it, it's kind of community and relationship driven. And so we knew some people that were interacting uh, with kind of this group of interns. And so 
and I think as with everything in space flight and life otherwise, it's really team oriented. And so the team that we were working with was kind of this NASA center team, but actually the payload that we had sort of a segment of was a group of people that were part of this uh, West Virginia Space Consortium is the name of it. So every state has sort of a space grant program that goes into that. And so that group that West Virginia sent up, sent up a payload that had a number of different components of which the one that I was involved with developing with the NASA interns was sort of a component of that. So yeah, a lot of layers there. And it, it's like, it, you know, I think like with everything that's complex that we're trying to achieve, there's a lot of people with different skill sets and different expertise going into it and the relationships are a huge part of it. So can you tell us a little, tell a little bit more about what you were, what the, um, a little bit more about how, how to, that experiment worked and maybe about the um, what you are working on with the International Space Space Station? Yep, so uh, the, the, what we did as part of this rock set thing with the NASA interns was developing a payload, again, to go up on this sounding rocket that was sort of proof of concept, can we have something that works and recovers it? And so what we sent up um, and got back was a sort of 3D printed device that um, can do fluorescence imaging. And because this is kind of a trainee-driven program because we get these interns, um, one of the constraints was a little different than something that you would have with, you know, say something that, um, you know, that was a mainline NASA program, and that was that it had to be really low cost. And so mm -hmm. what they ultimately came up with was sort of a 3D printed platform uh, for doing fluorescence detection. So the way that it worked was they had a box that they made out of 3D printer, and inside that box was, uh, at the heart of it was, I think what a lot of your viewers probably know about when you're talking about hackerspaces was a Raspberry Pi. So if you don't know about it, a Raspberry Pi is a single board computer that uh, you can use to, it's it's kind of like an Arduino, but um, it runs a full version of Linux, so you can run you know full scripts and things like that that you would run on essentially a big computer. And that was driving a camera module that was used to do the fluorescence detection. So that camera was pointed at our samples. And what we were doing on that one was not so much actually doing the fluorescence detection, but the proof of concept. But ultimately, what you hope to get out of it at the end is a camera that's pointed at the samples. Uh, there's uh, light sources that you use to make the samples fluoresce. And then that, that camera interface to that Raspberry Pi, which is also controlling those light sources, reads the samples as you go. And so what we did here was basically show that we can get this back up and down cover it and it works when we get it back to the ground. And so that was kind of that stage of it. Then the next stage uh, for something that might go up to the ISS would be uh, um, sort of scoped in, in a slightly different way. Um, on the ISS, they have some of the fluorescence instrumentation that kind of obviates the need for things like this camera. So on the ISS, they have, uh, you know, our thing, what we talked about there that went up on that sounding rocket, was about $30 worth of components, which is really nice because you can imagine you can do that for low cost fluorescence detecting a lot of different applications. But on the ISS, um, you know, they're, they're sending rockets up there continually and they have a number of different devices on there. One of the ones they have up there is something called a fluorescence plate reader. So what a fluorescence plate reader does is it can take a large number of samples and ask the question, are these samples fluorescent? I keep talking about fluorescence. Um, why is fluorescence important? Well, we've developed a large number of ways to sort of probe biological processes using fluorescence, and that can tell that can tell us information about sort of how biological molecules are interacting with each other and what they're up to. So, uh, what that plate reader can do is basically do the same thing that our low-cost device did, but with a large number of samples. So, on that ISS, they have one that can use a plate that contains hundreds of samples, it's either uh, a little under 100 or just a little under 400 samples, uh, and probe those. And so, you know, having more instrumentation up there, the, the barriers are correspondingly higher to get up there because obviously there's a lot of, a lot of people that want to go into space. And so there's a number of programs uh, that you go through with um, different organizations that are affiliated with NASA on some level. And again, you know, I mentioned the relationships here with space flight, you're trying to do some really difficult stuff. So there's a lot of people with a lot of different skill sets. Um, what these organizations do is they're the people that essentially evaluate the projects that will go up onto the ISS. 
and also allocate the money for that. So to do the type of experiment that we were talking about on that little sounding rocket cost quite a bit of money. You know, it's a few tens of thousands of dollars. And then when you talk about going up to the ISS and doing your little experiment, that can get into you know the, the low to mid six figures with that. Mm. And so with that is kind of a process where they evaluate, what are we gonna learn from this? Uh, what's gonna go into it? Why is this new and why is this important? And so there's kind of this process of allocating the money as well as allocating the space on the ISS. Because as you can imagine, like I said, a lot of people wanna go into space using that instrument, that fluorescence plate reader that I talked about that can do the kind of detection that we were doing with our low cost device, but on more samples. Um, and also in a more sensitive way. Uh, as you can imagine, that's running pretty much all the time. So to get your slot, it gets evaluated by a number of scientists that are looking at, you know, is this an important question and what are we gonna learn that's new about it? Mm -hmm. And this is probably part of the game that you're playing right now, but there's also probably that question of weight because every single pound that you put into a piece of equipment has to be so much uh, cost for getting that to actually leave the, the the gravity of the earth. Right? Am I making things up? Am I a ghost? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was going to ask the same question, like, uh, you know, and working um, to get your projects up into space, how much does weight come up? Because I've always heard, you know, there's some sort of figure that's out there that, you know, for for every single pound, it costs you know X thousand dollars to put it into space. Yeah, weight is huge for sure. And we, um, I honestly forget what ours were. Uh, every mission has what's called a weight budget associated with it, just for the reason that you described. Because said, uh, you know, stuff is heavy and gravity works. So to to, to get the thing off the ground, you can only be so heavy. And, and um, what we were talking about with ours, where again, this happens a lot with space programs, where there's a huge team of people going into this and everyone has you know their own priorities and interests and we're trying to get this done together um when we got down to the point where we were doing our experiment and we were looking at how we did it you know we had this big sounding rocket and then that was subdivided into i think they call it hotels or something where where each you know, individual payload goes that was further subdivided for us and so we had both a space and a weight budget and what we were talking about was um I forget the exact number, but it's on the order of hundreds of grams. So I think what we put up there, which was really at the edge of what we could do, was less than half a pound. That is a ridiculous tiny amount for... I'm just trying to think, we're trying to get a hold of an autoclave right now, and they keep saying it's almost 300 pounds. So I'm <laughs> trying to think of how that even works. Right, and that, that's the, the, the constraints that we're talking about, that's part of what we're doing was we were aiming for low cost, but we also had to have a low weight because you know we had those couple hundred grams to work with. That plate reader that I just described that's on the space station, you know, one person can lift it, but it's pretty heavy. You're talking 40, 50 pounds. So just getting that up there in the first place, yeah, and, uh, that was probably a pretty, um, and I'm not making a pun here, pretty heavy lift because uh, <laughs> uh, you know we, we, we you you really have to make the case that we're going to get a lot out of it. So, you know, every ounce, pound, gram, whatever it counts as you're going up there. I completely object. I think that pun was intentional. <laughs> uh, I know that you're our guest and I shouldn't try to call you out right now, but at the same time, there's no way that was unintentional. <laughs> um, but, you know, this so, actually, oh, sorry, how are you unmuted? I'm sure you have a question, sorry. No, so I was, I was basically just going to ask Aaron, um, with regards to uh, the fluorescence reader that's powered by the Raspberry Pi. I know you had shared a preprint earlier this year on, uh, you know, an isothermal amplification strategy. Um, and that sort of described a fluorescence uh, reader. And it looks like that paper is now published in RNA. Is it described anywhere else? I kind of want to share the links uh, to the community if they're interested. Yeah, in it is. There's another preprint um, where uh, I honestly forget what we put into it, if it's the, the full schematic of it or everything that went into it, but we describe it in more detail in another one where we used it because um, as you're alluding to, and um, what we have here is kind of a low cost fluorescence detection platform and we were doing low cost fluorescence detection because we're working with these interns and I think they had a budget of something like 500 bucks we ended up picking in some money but we're not talking about you know like million dollar space flight experiments because this is really low cost stuff and so since then we've used that and sort of stuff that developed out of that and uh, what you're alluding to with uh, low cost fluorescence detection which also goes into things like diagnostics you know we talked about COVID earlier and um, the uh, 
there's a lot of utility in having something where you can ask, you know, is something fluorescent? Because the when we're talking about COVID diagnostics and what they're doing in hospitals right now, when someone is uh, takes a COVID test that goes into an instrument that also is determining whether COVID is present based on measuring fluorescence. And so that instrument that's in the hospital, it's not something you're gonna have in certainly every doctor's office because those costs between, it depends on what you're doing, but you're talking you know, high five to low six figures, you know, $50,000 or so for one of these instruments. And so there's a lot of promise and stuff like this that can go into things that do these low cost diagnostics, both for tests, uh, you know, like you've worked on for things in the developing world, as well as, as you appreciate, things that I think COVID has kind of redirected our attention to and kind of captured people's imagination as um, things that we could potentially do in places like doctor's offices, things that we could do for diagnostics at you know points of entry at airports or for doing diagnostics of students and you know having something that's really low cost like that it's not just useful for something like this for this space flight it also goes into things where we could do this type of distributed testing one of the reasons that we're struggling with COVID testing so much is that there's any number of things that can be a bottleneck um, one of which is that instrument that they use in these diagnostic labs to do testing so with the possibility of having something distributed like this that's low cost, um, it's possible that you know our tests, your tests, or any number of tests that people have developed that also use fluorescence to detect the presence of something that's associated with a disease, whether it's COVID, or you can imagine you know thinking beyond COVID. I realize it, 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 it kind of feels now like we're never going to be out of this, but someday we'll come out the other end. And these aren't just you know COVID tests; these are really disease detection platforms. And you can imagine doing something like distributed testing in a doctor's office, where now we talk about like a rapid strep test that takes a few hours to come back. You can imagine a rapid strep test that also tests for antibiotic resistance that you do while you're sitting there talking to, to the physician. And so, yeah, there, there's absolutely, I think a lot that can be done with this type of low cost thing. And that's something that NASA is really interested in too, is that, um, you know, the space flight developed and, you know, the sort of technology race after the Cold War we got integrated circuits out of it, and that's why we're talking on this right now. We're taking advantage of that. These types of platforms that are that are being developed. Um, you know, if, if you're bummed out about COVID and you've been sitting at home all day, uh, you know, locked down like everyone else, and you're doing what you need to do to keep spreading, I, I would definitely take heart in the fact that uh, um, we haven't even realized the type of stuff that we're going to get out of these types of low cost detection platforms because it's going to the the sort of knock on effects, just like with integrated circuits they're going to extend well beyond, you know, the immediate problem. They're going to be able to do a lot with these. Yeah, I think sort of a silver lining of this pandemic is that, um, you know, diagnostics have uh, not received a lot of attention or funding necessarily. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, billions and billions of dollars that are going towards this exact problem of low cost, rapid uh, point of care, point of use sort of diagnostics. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, that, you know, you're certainly aware of this, but just for viewers, it, you know, historically, you know, we, we keep coming back to money as we're talking about this stuff. And yeah, it's, it's obviously not the only thing, but it's kind of, it's a gating thing that makes, that, that essentially decides whether stuff is going to happen. And we fund what we decide is important. And historically, there's been money for low cost diagnostics, but um, it's typically been developed towards or focused towards humanitarian applications because I think if you went you know a year ago to a funding agency and said I have a low-cost test and I want to put in every doctor's office they'll say well you know you can send something out to a lab and you have these instruments that you use that you know we're running most of the COVID tests on but now I think yeah, the people naturally think in terms of you know their own self-interest now we're realizing we need these low-cost tests too we need you know inexpensive diagnostics because that can solve our immediate problem but there's also a lot of utility in this for other things and so again, uh, like you mentioned, the, the, this whole silver lining, and, um, I think we're gonna get a lot out of this. We're gonna get some of these things like low cost tests. We're also, um, you know, we're testing things that we've never tested before. If you look at the vaccines that are going through um, so that they're, if you've been following this, they're developing vaccines faster than we ever have. There's, there's this program called Operation Warp Speed where it, uh, we have a few different vaccines. We're essentially taking an everything, throw everything at it approach. And there's some that work kind of like traditional vaccines that look really promising. And then we're pr pursuing additional platforms. Uh, there's a company called Moderna that uses long strands of RNA that code for proteins. And their vaccine has a, uh, essentially an RNA that will make one of the proteins that's associated with COVID. So you mount an immune response to it. 
And then similarly, um, there's actually vaccines that kind of sound like science fiction, but they, um, they essentially use a more benign virus to get your body to express something from out in the immune response for it. And there's been clinical trials on it, but it hasn't really gone into large scale uh, deployment. But now, you know, given the present moment and how critical it is that we're doing some of this stuff, that's going into people too, and we're using that for COVID vaccine. And so regardless of what comes out of this, I suspect we'll end up getting more than one or hopefully we're gonna get more than one. We're gonna have the experience from that that's gonna let us do a lot of things that I think we really didn't have the imagination or at least appetite to do before COVID. I feel like all paths lead to COVID again in this even Kerbal Space Program. It's when you're talking on Zoom with people all this day. This also though ties to the concept of astrobiology to an extent though, just because you know, we're looking for these small molecule detection and we're looking for smaller and smaller and cheaper and uh, easier to travel with tools to actually look at biology. And yet we don't have a lot of idea of the small molecules that actually are where biology starts, which that might be a bit forced um, <laughs> for an analysis. I think it's also like, it's, it's meaningful just because I think we're starting to look at things like uh, cell-free systems and detections. We're starting to look for detections that are just small molecule based. And so that kind of goes into this idea of questioning the beginnings of life and where actually things come from and how these small molecules interact in very simple scenarios and can lead to more complex biology. And so how much of this um, push for more smaller, lighter, less complicated assays, tests, uh, is pushing an interest towards things that are in the realm of astrobiology. So yeah, cost is absolutely a driver, as we alluded to with you know the, the sounding rockets and the other stuff that we're doing. Um, yeah, the, you're definitely limited in weight, but you're also limited in terms of the budget that you do. So and, um, anytime a space exploration mission is kind of scoped, then you decide, okay, we're 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 going to launch a rocket. We're going to ask some questions, but we can't ask all the questions that we want. And um, the uh, you're limited by money and you're also limited by instrumentation and uh, you know i kind of do the comparison between the 30 dollar low cost thing that we have in sounding rocket and the the instrument that i described that's on the iss costs about fifty thousand dollars or something like that um there's also the question of weight you know if it, uh, my heavy lift joke it wasn't easy getting that plate reader out there and so you're always limited in terms of what you can actually get there and so until now um we've had uh, instruments that we use to essentially ask the question uh, of is life present using things that we're actually able to get there. So getting there is not trivial. You know, we just had the three Mars launches in quick succession this summer. Um, those aren't going to get there for six months or so because the way that something gets to Mars, um, you know, current technology, we use something called a Hohmann transfer which does this trick basically where we kind of slingshot it through both planets gravity mm -hmm. so doing that um we've got a we're taking advantage of the orbits of the two planets and so you're kind of limited in, in uh the time scale there so that's going to take six months or so um so you know you've got to get everything there and then you actually have to run the experiment and you know we're talking about like you said everything coming back to COVID. we're talking about um the limitations and what we can do when we get there because every experiment is going to consume some sort of resource that you sent up there, whether it's you know chemicals that go into the experiment that you do or gases or things like that. And so by the time you get there and you spend your few billion dollars, uh, you've probably got just a few shots at it. So you have to be really targeted in the way that you can do it. And so um, we've you know uh, had a lot of successes in the astrobiology community in getting information out of those instruments, and you're that I think has been really hard won uh, because that's taking into account, you know, the difficulty associated with getting there and being limited in the questions you can ask. There's a lot of things that are inferred that you wouldn't otherwise do if you're doing an experiment on Earth. And then that comes back to some of the missions that were launched this year where we're collecting samples for a future sample return mission. And the idea there with sample return is that once you get the sample back to Earth, you're only limited by well, I guess either way, if you're doing the experiment, you're limited by what technology you have present near the sample. So on Mars, you've basically got what you can get on a rocket. But if you get the sample back, then you can use all the analytical instrumentation that you have on Earth and 
the level of information that you can get out of that is, you know, orders of magnitude higher than uh, what you can uh, get out of there with an instrument that you're asking to go through all the trauma associated with spaceflight and landing there, the limited reagents that you have, things break as you go, uh, you run into things that you don't expect. And so what's so exciting about these sample return missions is that, uh, you know, eventually we will get these back on Earth. We're going to be able to analyze them by techniques that simply wouldn't be possible and would not be possible at all um, with you know current technology and basically what we can get onto another uh, celestial body. So I'm going to jump in real quick and I think maybe guide, we can keep doing this discussion, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the rocket I have right here and then we can look at the um, the the space station that I am trying to build and we're gonna then going to try to dock it, launch the rocket, and then dock it to his, dock it to that uh, existing space station that is very like barely built yet. But I think keeping in mind a lot of what you're talking about, we have um, this rocket right here has a science lab on it actually, and. Uh, has some other instrumentation on there um, and two Kerbals in there. We got Bill and Bob Curran um, and we also need to deliver some oxygen up to the space station because the Andy was very concerned when I talked to him about how the Kerbals can die in this game. Um, like that when we played around with us yesterday. Yeah, so uh, because of the mod um, the um, Jebediah, who's up there now, could uh, suffocate if he runs out of air in four days, so we need to get get him more air. And then we just have it attached to a rocket here. So I am going to now go just... out and we're going to go look at the space station we have. Um, and then... I just want to just jump in and say that it makes it so much more nerve-wracking in any character in any game if you name them. Like, when, uh, when Jordan and I were playing around with this, they named our Kerbal Valentina, and I thought, oh, they named them after the first female cosmonaut in space, and that's so cool. And then as soon as I realized that and realized the Kerbal could die, I did not like this game anymore. Um, and so I'm very nervous about this launch, but excited at the same exact time. I'd like it that it's Bob, because I feel like that's generic enough. No offense to everyone's friends named Robert, but it's generic enough that, like, I'm not going to be as sad if Bob dies. Oh, do you want to see? We can see Jebediah here now. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't feel strongly for Jebediah. He's not named after anyone real. Like, the fact that they named a space character Valentina, and I don't know how you pronounce things in Russia, but it's Tereshkova, right? That was the first female cosmonaut in space. Like, that can't be a coincidence. I don't know if Jebediah is someone important in space. Maybe I'm just ignorant to the space program that allowed me to be okay with it. We only discuss U.S. space programs over here. <laughs> I knew about Valentina. I feel like I feel like she's important. So over here, we've got basically all I have so far is some solar panels and Jebediah and a docking port. But we're going to send up our science mission and then hopefully can... I would like can to I imagine that we have a, a, a plate reader up there and we can do some fluorescence imaging, but... Uh, yeah. I, can you I, make I, him I, sing Space Oddity? What's that? Can you make him sing Space Oddity with an acoustic guitar? Jebediah? Yeah. Uh, I don't think he has one. He, right, he would never... be up for it, but okay. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going to go now back and we're going to launch this rocket and then continue in this conversation. I, I feel like I broke it up a little bit, but if we want to go back to what we were talking about. Um, uh, does anyone remember where we were with that? Yeah, I had a couple of questions about where it ended up. So I, I guess one of the things that I was curious about was what sort of uh, design aspects go into making sure that you know once say you send a probe to mars you're not actually 
uh, measuring earth compounds. And then once you bring the samples back, um, how do you make sure that you're measuring things that were actually from Mars as opposed to uh, contaminated somewhere in between? So if you could elaborate there, Aaron, that'd be interesting. Yeah, that's definitely a huge part of what people designing these missions think about. And one where, it, uh, you know, I mentioned that there's a huge teams that go into these. Everyone has different things that you're thinking about. So it, uh, NASA calls this planetary protection. So the idea is that um, you don't want to have uh, forward contamination of another body. Uh, and by forward contamination, like you said, sending microbes or some form of life from Earth to Mars um, and then getting kind of a false positive for the detection of life. And um, the short answer is that we do the best that we can. And, um, you know, that these are machine pieces of metal that they, that they there's a great deal of effort that goes into sterilizing them and uh, trying to uh, ensure that we're not getting that. Um, and uh, some of the questions on the chat on YouTube kind of tie back to this where um, and, uh, uh, any uh, spacecraft that you launch is going to experience a lot of radiation along the way because it's going through space and, and, and doesn't have an atmosphere. And so that kind of ties into some of what uh, Gordana, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, was asking um, that you need to collect from below the surface if you expect life. Problem was that the inside field didn't work for, for properly. And then um, kind of a second question there from uh, her and Andrew on the chat. Um, was, uh, I guess, Andrew rephrasing Gradana's question uh, about reviving the organism. Um, uh, so yeah, there's, um, anytime you launch a spacecraft to another planet that's going to experience this heavy dose of radiation, that's going to be cosmic uh, radiation. So, you know, the, the sort of nuclear power plant bomb type of radiation you think about, as well as a huge dose of UV radiation, because it's not going to have the ozone layer that we're going through and, and uh, things like that. And then that tie ties into Gordana's question about below the surface. And this is what you've touched on is the reason that a number of people at NASA are especially interested in subsurface life because at the surface of any given body, that depending on its whole situation with an atmosphere is experiencing is a lot of cosmic radiation potentially as well as a lot of UV radiation, all of which can be sterilizing. and this is sort of the stuff that people kind of fight about at meetings, how much dose of cosmic radiation, how much dose of UV radiation is sufficient to kill something. Um, it obviously is not good for a lot of these organisms, but there are organisms that can tolerate huge doses. Um, we know from Earth, there's a, a genus of organisms called radiodurians that can tolerate huge doses of uh, um, ionizing radiation. Um, and as a result, a lot of people have focused on the subsurface for that, re for the reason that, um, you know, if you're under some dirt, that's going to protect you, uh, as well as there's the potential of subsurface water. And water is obviously critical for all forms of life, at least that we know of, because that's driving so many metabolic processes. And I so, want to jump in real quick, you guys. Uh, can we get a countdown for me to launch my rocket? Can you all kind of collectively try to do that together? <laughs> really? Yeah. All right. Oh, this is going. This is go time. <laughs> are we reading something? Or are you going to give us the like, start? What, what do you want us to count down from? And count, down, count down from 10 and then decide together how to do that. <laughs> so you, I think you should initiate this, Jordan, and then we'll support your countdown. I will join, jump in once I understand the rhythm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. OK. All right, let me make sure also first I have. I feel like I have to, for some reason, prep myself for this. <laughs> <laughs> OK. That was weirdly anticlimactic for me. Uh, sorry, everybody. <laughs> But it's, it's like it's a real good. launch, though, where you're not sure if it worked for a while. Um, well, I mean, sorry, I feel like we interrupted though, and I, I kind of want to just throw some shade at some nucleic acids right now. Wouldn't it be nice if some organisms had something like DSUP or some kind of protein that would shield their nucleic acids? Because nucleic acids are weak and brittle. Um, 
So ignoring for the sake of discussion that you've just slammed the clay acids, which are the best biopolymer, uh, I, I would add that um, this has been something that I feel like historically there's been kind of two camps in astrobiology, which um, I, I think there's been a big earth focus that, that um, there definitely has been some people that were considering other bodies, and I think others have shifted towards that over the years. But thinking about life on earth, um, we know that obviously life on earth uses DNA and RNA, and it also uses protein. Um, and I think that the excitement about RNA as the first polymer came about about you know, 30, 35 years ago when um, we first discovered that RNA, in addition to carrying information like it does in biology, can also act as a catalyst. And these are present in your own body. Um, when your body makes a protein, you know, it starts with DNA in your genome, it makes RNA, and then that RNA uh, actually kind of does surgery on itself and cuts out some pieces of it that aren't going to code for the protein. And that reaction involves RNA acting sort of like an enzyme. So people got excited about the idea that the same polymer could act to carry information and act as an enzyme. And this is really appealing from the perspective of getting life started because thinking about copying RNA is a lot easier than thinking about copying protein because, you know, in DNA and RNA, you've got base pairs where you have an A and a T or an A and a U and a G and a C and it's kind of rule based and protein folding, not that RNA folding is an easy problem, but protein folding is a lot trickier. And so the idea that um, I think one polymer could sort of do everything was really seductive to a lot of people. And I think for a long time, yeah, as you're suggesting, Andy, people were uh, thinking of, you know, okay, it was RNA, it was just an RNA world. That, that, um, as you can imagine, this is a field where people have their own opinions and it kind of split the camps and people have many different ideas about it. There was certainly a contingent that said, yeah, it was RNA all along. I, and, I that think was, just, and that was and that was something, did you talk about Jack Shostak a little bit? Because I know that you, uh, didn't you, weren't you in a postdoc in his lab? Yep, so I, I, I worked with Jack who, um, I, I think sort of how he came to be involved with the RNA world. Um, I actually never talked to him about this, but uh, sort of inferred from his publications over the years was um, he did some work on uh, these pieces of RNA that, you know, I mentioned RNAs kind of do surgery on themselves and cut out little pieces of it. Those little pieces are called introns, and um, he was kind of involved with some of that early work on uh, figuring out that RNA could do this sort of self-surgery reaction. Um, and I think that led a lot of people to, you know, I mentioned ideas capturing people's imagination. That led a lot of people to reconsider exactly what nucleic acids could do. And that's where, you know, several fields have kind of come out of that. Um, the RNA world field that I mentioned, as well as uh, aptamers, which are sort of, it's like an antibody, but made of nucleic acids. People have developed ways to select those from big populations with sort of random RNAs where uh, you can actually get out of a pool of, you know, uh, sort of billions stacked on billions of RNAs, about 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 uh, different sequences. RNAs that bind kind of like an antibody to a specific target. And so he sort of seemed to come to that after that. And since then, his lab has been focused on the original life generally, um, principally focused on it from that RNA angle. But as I mentioned, I think that there were that there, there seems to have been a shift in this. It, it's kind of tough to see history happen as you're, you're, you're watching it as a participant and observer. But I, I started my I guess graduate training, which uh, was in 2005, and now I'm an assistant professor 15 years later, and just um, you know, kind of having watched the discussions that people are having at meetings 15 years ago versus now, I think there's a lot of people that sort of thought about nucleic acids only versus thinking, and I, I would include Jack in this too, based on some of the work that he was doing while I was there, and it's done since, that there could have been kind of a collaborative role for nucleic acids and proteins. And we see sort of evidence for this in biology. If you look at um, the machine that makes proteins in our cells and all cells is called the ribosome, and that's made of RNA and protein. And we can look, based on analysis of organisms that we've seen evolve over time, how much RNA is in there and how much protein is in there. And it looks like that RNA and protein kind of working together is a very ancient feature of it. So that's sort of evidence, if you think of the ribosome, so this protein-making machine as kind of a molecular fossil, um, that these could have been collaborating very early on. That said, I need to pile on Andy a little bit and say that the core of the ribosome is actually made of RNA exclusively. So it's mm -hmm. actually RNA through metallicis. But there definitely was this collaborative role, or it looks like there's increasing evidence, at least, for this collaborative role for RNA and protein. 
very early on, and I think that a lot of people's thinking has kind of softened in that regard and shifted towards uh, kind of accepting what both can do because I, I joke about RNA being the best polymer because it is, but and, um, they they have their own strengths and weaknesses. And uh, you know, as Andy mentioned, RNA is, I'll admit to it being a brittle polymer. And uh, if you take a solution of RNA and you leave it out on your bench, um, it will, uh, like all polymers fall apart over time, but RNA will do that in a particularly fast way versus proteins, uh, they tend not to fall apart, uh, at least in terms of falling into pieces like RNA does quite as easily. And so there's definitely features of both that are appealing from the perspective of doing the type of chemistry that life does. And um, you know, there, there's a reason that both are involved here. I feel like I should apologize for my antagonism for RNA. So like, as a protein defender, I am the minority of our organization and I need to be vocal and proud <laughs> um, in defending proteins because I don't think proteins get enough love, but I- I, 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 I feel like protein's already won, you know? I mean, it, it, the life does most of what it does with proteins. And, and there's, uh, and I'll, I'll do the love fest part with proteins here. Uh, there's a reason proteins are so good at catalyzing reactions and making things, things happen, and that's because if you look at proteins, uh, you know, you've basically got this backbone, and then it's got what we call the side chain hanging off of it. And there's 20 or a few more different side chains in protein, and they're all really different. Chemically, they look very different, and they can do different things, and so you've got this toolbox of different things that things like protein enzymes use and each one is kind of adapted to a problem. And so we can actually look at like the three-dimensional structure of these proteins and see how they do exactly what they do. And you know, they look like works of art. And um, they, it's like you've got sort of an assembly line and the, the amino acids are kind of the tools and they're oriented exactly the right way to do exactly what they do. And then ribozymes, they kind of get the job done, but not much more. And, uh, if you look at like the ribosome, which really is, you know, I'm not, I'm not joking here, is a, is a ribozyme. What it's doing essentially is bringing two things together close in space that were gonna react in the first place and sort of speeding up what was gonna happen anyway. So, and, uh, I, and I think that's really reflective of the conversation change that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years in the community where people sort of acknowledge that, yeah, there, there's, there's strengths and weaknesses to both. So, uh, I don't know if you guys are watching the lo the now successful uh, orbiting, but we have, achi Yay! Achieved, we have achieved we have achieved we have achieved stable orbit um, around Kerbin, uh, and now I just have to figure out how to get it to match the orbit of the uh, space station, which is hard. Okay. Well, so, Jordan. We, we've got a couple of questions on the YouTube chat um, okay. that I think I know the answers to, but I just wanted to ask you. Yes. Uh, the first is, uh, did you build the rocket? And the second question, is this a game I can buy? Did I build the rocket? Yes, I did. Um, uh, although I followed a tutorial for building part of it, but the rocket that I just sent up, I built the payload myself and followed the tutorial for... Uh, the actual rocket part. Um, and this is a game you can buy. Yes, it's on Steam. Um, it, which the Steam gaming platform for PC. I think you can play it on console too, but that seems difficult to me because um, you can... Uh, the controls are very like precise. So I don't know if you can actually play it on console, but you can get it on Steam for about 40 bucks, I think. Cool, awesome. And then there's the comment from Bill Distel, uh that the rockets look like phages. Rockets look like phages? I guess this yeah. one did have sort of like the, um, the, uh, a very the sort capsid. of like, capsid like payload. That's a, that's a good way to think about it, I guess. I don't know. All right, so the next step for me to do this is to match the inclinations of these orbits. So basically, like, I need to make sure they're not tilted relative to each other. Otherwise, we're going to miss... It's going to be very hard to intersect. So... Uh, All very complex. Very complicated. This is such what a hard game. What continent did you launch from in Kerbal? What continent? Yeah, because there are... These are all very weird continents. 
Uh, the space. It looks like the station is over here, on okay. what looks like some some somewhat similar to. Oh, does it African look sub African continent? I don't know. Well, it no, looks it's all Pangea, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks like it's all one thing. I don't know. I haven't really investigated. Uh, what? I have. I've played this game for a little bit, and I have not actually thought much about what Kerbin itself looks like. I feel like I'm focusing on the wrong thing, so I will be quiet. That's okay. Uh, so yeah, so I just have to do some stuff. So, uh, yeah, so RNA proteins. <laughs> <laughs> They're both great. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I think I, I am also, I would agree that I am, uh, I, I can see both sides of RNA and proteins being great. I think they're both great. Well, that's very diplomatic, and I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but that's, yeah, that's neither here nor there. Um, I'm going to for a second. So, you know, the question that we were getting from Gordana is just how we actually end up looking for, like, on other planet. I was talking about things are um underground but what's the i think one of the things that whenever i talk to people about astrobiology um one of the things that i always get back as feedback is just well well why do we care what aliens look like if they're not going to talk to us why would we get excited about uh bacteria on mars or bacteria on the moon and so i always give a very half-assed answer of just or half oh I'm not supposed to swear. Uh, half, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, um, this is so hard for me. Um, not great answer of just, you know, it answers some questions about how life starts here, and it might give us some, you know, just like looking for life in the rainforest, we find cures for potential things here. Uh, but is there a more fleshed out answer from uh, a qualified astrobiologist than like what, than what I can just regurgitate quickly? I would take exception with being called a qualified astrobiologist. So. No, I, I, <laughs> no, I'm, dead, no, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, no, because now I went qualified as in like someone who's achieved quality. I don't know how to. No, I, 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 the reason I say is because I feel like this is one of those fields where and, um, it, it's inherently interesting. I think because it, it's the most curiosity-driven question about where did we come from? You know, did, yeah. did this happen on Earth? Did it happen on another planet at first? And did it seed Earth? And yeah, the reason I, I joke about saying I, I, I take exception to being qualified is that and, um, it's one of, I feel like the, the, it's a very friendly and welcoming field at the same time as being one of the most contentious. And that's because um, it, it's often difficult to tell whether we've gotten across the finish line in the same way as it would be for biology. Because, and, um, you know, if we're, I realize I'm coming back to COVID again and not to bump people up, but when we're asking a question about COVID and we want to say, how does one of these proteins in COVID work? We make a bunch of that protein, we do some experiments on it, and we learn more about that. And we know that's the protein in COVID and at the end, um, we have that. For life, I feel like we have this N equals one of life on earth. And we know that there's this incredible diversity of life on earth. And there's humans and bacteria and all these different animals. Um, we've learned, you know, that they're interrelated and there's things that happen there and we've learned a lot about evolution. But then if you go back to that really early time, and, um, you know, all we can really say is that we know that life happened once, uh, or at least once really, and were there competing forms of chemistry that were happening that died out and there was something else that would work better or what we have right now took off as kind of a historical accident. And then beyond that, we know that, um, you know, there certainly was influence in the environment that it evolved in. And so and, uh, on Earth, we know we have, you know, a lot of liquid water, and that works pretty well with life here. Um, it obviously works really well because we're all sitting here, you know, 70% water, and, and all the reactions are happening in concentrated water solutions. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I, I think it can help us understand who we are and how life works to consider some of these other possibilities. You know, if you look at planets where there's a lot of liquid hydrocarbons like Titan, that can cause you to kind of consider other chemistries. And uh, by other chemistries, I mean, you know, we're, we're thinking about 
life working in water here because that, that's sort of what we're operating with. But if you look at water relative to a lot of other liquid solvents, water is pretty weird. And um, it doesn't really act like anything else. If you look at, um, I still remember there was a figure like in a chemistry textbook in, in undergrad where they compare water to kind of the closest analog. So water is H2O. So you got basically as many hydrogens bought into that, uh, that middle atom as you can. If you look at methane, so that's CH4, so you have four hydrogens bonded to it, its boiling point is like negative 100 degrees. And then if you look at ammonia, which is NH3, its boiling point is like negative 50 degrees, something like that. But then water boils at 100 degrees. And so that's because of a lot of the stuff that's, that's weird about water. And that weirdness translates not just to stuff like boiling point, but the environment that it provides for biology to operate in. So all the stuff that we're talking about, thinking about proteins and DNA and RNA and isolation, that's happening as a consequence of basically where it lives. You know, water is this weird solvent that does all these different things to molecules. And then in the context of that water, there's DNA and RNA and, and proteins folding up and kind of doing their thing. You can easily imagine that if you went to a different planet, um, say you went to Titan and you were looking at like liquid methane and life evolved in liquid methane, you could imagine coming up with something that's really different. Again, methane has got that much lower boiling point, and that results from the fact that methane doesn't like to stick to methane nearly as much as water likes to stick to water. And that feature of water sticking to itself is what drives a lot of what's happening in biochemistry. And you know, you can imagine what we just went through with, with Titan and that other example as this is kind of this curiosity and we're thinking about what might be happening in other planets and uh, what's happening in a very different solvent. But if you look at the inside of a protein and the stuff that's hanging out there, you know, we mentioned the 20 plus different amino acids and the different side chains that you have. In a lot of cases, the core of proteins in some ways looks more like methane than it does like water. And so biology kind of has this situation where everything's happening in water. You know, it, it's your blood and all your other fluids are, are mostly water. But then kind of where the action is inside proteins where they're doing all the type of chemistry that they're doing it's in this environment where it's sort of created or life has sort of created this separate environment that's very distinct from water that enables some of these chemical transformations that life can do that um uh really couldn't happen in water otherwise and so uh, I, I think that we learn a lot from this about considering what life look, might look like on other planets that in turn teaches us some about uh, you know the, the type of chemistry that life as we know it is doing. My computer. So, George, what are we what are we looking at now? Uh, we are currently trying to make the orbit uh, so there's multiple intersections uh, of the so the orbit intersects more than one time so we're trying to like change it so that there's only one intersection point which is where I am currently headed so I know this is gonna sound really weird but I don't want to keep anyone longer than we expected um, and so just just this is a weird thing to say about a space mission but what's the ETA of us <laughs> like running into the space station uh i don't know the last time uh i tried to do this it took about like three hours so i don't think we can do the whole thing but i will try my darndest um and it took a lot of like re-saving and trying over and over again so maybe it'll be faster this time but uh i really appreciate that you're trying so hard jordan i get it it's it's weird steering a spaceship. It's not rocket science. Yeah, so exactly? hey, Andy, I mean, it's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> I don't appreciate what anyone is doing on this Zoom call right now. I'm just throwing that out there. Like, I'm out. I'm quiet for a bit. So, Jordan, tell me, like, what are you doing from a, from a control perspective? Because, um, you know, we see your mouse sort of, like, hovering over the screen, and, like, you zoom in and zoom out, but... What do you actually have to do to guide this thing to dock to the space station? Um, so th you have to do a couple of things. So you can see this little like globe that's right here is called the nav ball that's sort of in the bottom center. 
Um, that's where you can uh, change the where your um, where your ship is pointing. So right now it's pointing radial in, which I think sort of means I'm bad at like. Uh, I'm not exactly. I'm very good. I have very bad spatial reasoning, but I ha so I am not very good at like saying where exactly that is. But anti-normal. Sure. You can go anti-normal, normal. Prograde is the direction you're moving. Retrograde, I think, is the opposite of the direction you're moving. So you basically like can point to all these directions and then uh, throttle up your rocket to go to that place. So is it asking you to use almost polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates? Uh, I, I don't know. Someone in the chat who plays this game can probably explain how this works better than I do. If anyone in the I know chat... the person on the the people on Twitch were saying that this is new to them too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so are you approaching uh, the station right now? Like, is there a chance that you can dock right now? Uh, nope, I am not anywhere close to where I need to be. Oh, okay. I was getting excited over that orange thing. I guess it's meaningless. Uh, that's one of the intersection points. Um, but you guys also have to be on the same time frame for right. when you're intersecting. Right, so you have to be there at the same time. Yeah, yeah. At the same, right. like, yeah. So there's a lot to... So even though the orbits intersect, it takes a lot to actually get you there at the same time. I feel like this is making me appreciate Katherine Johnson and Poppy Norcutt even more than, like, anything right now. Just the fact that they were able to figure this all out. Mm -hmm. Just let some astronauts just fly up there and be like, yeah, we figured it all out. It was that easy. Which I know it wasn't easy. I'm not trash-talking astronauts. I'm going to be quiet again. <laughs> I feel like I am just putting my foot in my mouth full. Okay, I missed that intersection point, so I'm going to try this again in the next one. Let's go forward a little bit. Very hard for me to be quiet for too long, so that did not last at all. Um, last. Uh, you can speed up time in this, too, so it's, that's nice. I mean, you just play around with gravity a little bit, right? Sure. Can you, can you tweak physics as you play? Like, can you decide gravity changes in the middle of this? Uh... Wait a minute. Oh, dear. <laughs> what happened? I changed the, um... I changed the orbit enough to the fact that we are now going to decay because our Kerbin periapsis is, uh... 60,000 kilometers, which means that, uh, if not a stable need... orbit, no, we're gonna now go down into the atmosphere again. So, I'm gonna restart this from my last save point. Oh no, did we kill Bob and whatever the other guy's name was? Bill, not yet, but it was Jebediah or something, right? Yeah, Jebediah is out on the space station, right? Jebediah is on the space station, Bill and Bob are, uh, on, uh, are and on this thing. Oh, we can sh let's let's look at them real quick. We can see them inside. The I don't thing. want to see the people that we're about to kill. <laughs> this feels very morbid. Wait, you where are they? Factory for a fiery death, and now we're gonna look at them. Usually, you can like see them. They don't let's want see. to be shown because they are. They're running out of oxygen. I don't know. Do, do they know they're in trouble? You said that you could that they. They have different like motivation, and they can get depressed. So they, are are they sad about this? <laughs> uh, I think they I just... am, they're sad. <laughs> uh, I think they get so... Star, go ahead. They get sad when they have not enough space or can't call. Like the things that they get sad about are uh, whether or not you can. They can like they want to look out at the stars, so they need a panoramic view. Plants make them happy. Being able to call home makes them happy, and having enough like space to move around makes them happy. I don't know if this like des very... descending to their fiery death. I don't know how how much that makes them happy or unhappy. So, so Kerbals don't fear death. It sounds like is what you're saying. <laughs> Maybe. This is. I feel like I want. To, is there a philosophy module that you can add to Kerbal <laughs> Space Program? 
Uh, sure. There's like all kinds of modifications. People mod the heck out of this game. I really, I really do hope that they have a philosophical one, and it's just a bunch of Kerbals sitting around in a room, just smoking and reading like philosophy books. I just that's how it works in my head. Do they all look like the the cucumbers from your guys' tweet, or are they like zucchini and then swash Kerbals too? And my follow-up question is: Do they fight with each other? Is there Kerbal racism, or is it? <laughs> Is this like a Veggie Tales? Like, <laughs> like, I'm really hoping that a lot of the younger people on our Twitch have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Kerbals come in all shapes and sizes. Actually, I feel like this, is, this is like okay, boomer, but okay, millennial. It's, it's you, you guys. <laughs> There's something so weird about what's happening right now on the Kerbals. <laughs> So, I'm I'm just staring at this. Did we ever get to have a good last look at Bob and, or are they now no longer dying? No, they're no longer dying because I reverted to it earlier. Um, I reverted my quick save, so I I can't find. Usually, you can see them like in the little corner, but uh, their picture is not showing up. I really like that we invited uh, a uh, someone who is an expert on astrobiology and synthetic biology, and then we have them just guesstimating on the, you know, the socioeconomic history and uh, society that lives on this animated space program planet. It's like we were talking about, you know, people have to come together and work together to achieve space missions. So and, uh, you got to have the cucumbers and the zucchinis and the, the other squash. They, they, they got to get along to get this done. And... Yeah, fair. I really do. I really think that we should start talking about the biology of the Kerbals themselves. Just like, do you think that it's ATCG for their DNA? Or do you think that it's one of the other alternatives that we've come up with in a lab? Seems like they should probably have a K, right? Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. K for Kerbal. Humans, we don't have an we don't have an H. <laughs> okay, I have a feeling that I actually Sorry. forgot to put the Kerbals in here because there's no crew. I'm gonna revert back all the way to the launch <laughs> Wait. because they're not here. I thought I added them. Maybe they're they because they ejected. No, because like it's. They're in the science bay, so they're not actually supposed to be driving the ship. The ship is, like, remote launched. But I think I may have not actually put them in the ship. So it's like a payload mission, right? You know, do you need a crew for that? Well, I need a crew to run the science experiments. Well, isn't, can Jebediah do it? Maybe. Although, I have to say, like, and I'm not knocking the plate reader at all, but if you're expecting two friends and then something shows up at your door and it's just a plate reader, that might be a little bit of a, that might be a little bit of a heartbreaking moment. Depends how excited you are about the plate reader. <laughs> yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, like if a plate reader showed up at my door, I would kind of be amped about it. <laughs> and you know, right now, if a stranger showed up at my door, I would be very upset about it, so. <laughs> we had plate readers in our living room for about six months before we moved out to start our position, because uh, um, the guys that, that Get going to the startups in, in Boston. They it was right when they had raised a bunch of money, and they had old plate readers they had bought on eBay and stuff, and, and uh, they were getting I rid of them. Wonder if they have a spare they, plate they, reader that we could. Have. So, so we, we got them from that. And since then, we get a lot of plate readers on eBay. I, I say fifty thousand dollars, but you can usually get them for about two. Uh, you know, older ones, obviously, but and, uh, we've got quite a few miles out of eBay for plate readers. Do you have a particular brand of plate reader that you like? I. So almost all the ones that we have are molecular devices, um, yeah. and that's because um, the software isn't tied to an individual instrument. So we have our, our plate reader that was acquired through like the normal channels, and then that software can run the other ones. So and, uh, that's the easiest one. And, and the plate readers they sell on eBay, um, not yeah. everyone. So for all out. those home buyouts. But yeah, but they they often do. For all those home biologists looking for a good plate reader for their living room. So my question is, should I keep going with the mission or launch again and actually put the Kerbals in the place? To be fair, I don't think we're going to be able to get to the space station. So this is really up to you, Jordan, because 
I mean, no, I don't... No, we're definitely not going to be able to get to the space station, but I can try. You know, uh, I'm not counting down again, but I think we could launch again. <laughs> okay, we can, I, we can not count down again and I can launch. Because there's like... no crew showing up. Does the crew, like, do they emote? Are there reactions during liftoff and orbit? Uh, yeah, I think so. They, yeah, they I'm were... trying to figure out like what the value add of having a crew is. Well, the since, other thing since is Jebediah that... Jebediah can run the experiments. Well, Jebediah is also up there all by himself, and I th feel like probably oh, okay. it's... Pro well, no, I think probably, like, safety-wise, you probably want more than one person on a... Um, on a space station at the time. There are three people on the You know what? We will just right hope now. that Jebediah is a graduate student just because, I mean, you should always have another person in the lab how many graduate students are there at two in the morning. So Jebediah is just going to, that's a joke for all the people who've gone through grad school out there. Um, enjoy that one. You're welcome. Um, sorry about that, everybody. I was, I was also thinking about like the, the two people in a lab uh, role that, is rarely followed mm -hmm. yeah i remember sitting at night at two in the morning surrounded by a bunch of bioreactors going this can't be safe so <laughs> yeah but oh. like think about that versus being in space you know sometimes when you're up for 48 hours it feels like you're in space when you're surrounded by a bunch of bioreactors at two in the morning this is just getting very personal at this point so never mind <laughs> okay uh I want the Kerbals to be there, so I think I'm going to... Oh, I can't revert flight. I guess it's been going too long. Oh! I guess I have to keep going. Oh, no. Um, that's... So we have a comment from Build Itself saying, No crew means you saved on lift-up mass. No need for oxygen, food, and water. But I have a follow-up question. Do we have a bunch of oxygen, food, and water, but no Kerbals? Is that is that what's going on here? Yes, I brought a bunch of oxygen up, and there is oxygen, food, and water and no kerbals but we saved the kerbal mass so that's that's at least that bad. <laughs> and i'm sure that the people on the kss will appreciate the supplemental oxygen food and water for them right well there's just yeah, the one person there's Jebediah just Jebediah. Well, well Jebediah is going to have a lot to eat mm -hmm. i guess I we have to keep going this is just a very very complicated oregon trail and you just went hunting <laughs> That's that's the way that I'm looking at this. <laughs> okay. You killed a bison. <laughs> you could use fifty of two thousand pounds of the meat. Yeah. I always loved that. Sorry, this is getting this is getting so off topic. It and really I, was a good metaphor for the bison, though. I mean, it's it, wasting the resource, and, 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 and you don't get everything you should out of it. You know, I want to make sure that we're not wasting this time, and so I have um, a really left a field question that I just wanted to ask about. Uh, in 2018, there was this paper uh, that I absolutely love and I assigned to some of my students um, about uh, octopi and where intelligence came from during the Cambrian. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion on this quickly. Do you think that octopi intelligence, Aaron, might have come from viruses from space? So I don't know the octopus paper. Um, I will send it to you. My gut feeling is probably not, but I'm honestly not familiar with the work. So and I don't know. Do you remember any of the specifics? Like exactly what they were saying was going on there? Well, they were saying that um, because the octopus intelligence uh, is such a different body morphology than anything else that we have in our uh, evolutionary record, and because we're constantly potentially getting bombarded with nucleic acid sequences from outer space, maybe uh, octopi intelligence just hopped a ride on a meteor or on a comet, made its way to Earth, and then, um, especially because with a lot of these that are made up with a lot of ice, it might have stayed stable inside of it, gotten out, gotten into the ocean, and then into, uh, you could have a organism with eight different brains in each of its legs. So and no, um, I, I definitely have uh, I'm definitely receptive to the whole panspermia idea that you alluded to that and, um, we were getting bombarded with you know life at some point and that, that that it was seeded from somewhere else. I don't think that 
we can really say with confidence how the earliest stuff kind of got booted up. Um, the the octopus question, I don't know. I, I, I don't know enough about octopus biology to say exactly what's going on there, but I feel like and, um, there's, uh, you know, kind of thinking of it from the whole Occam's razor perspective of what's the simplest explanation, there's so much weird stuff that happens in biology on Earth that I feel like you almost don't need to invoke that kind of explanation. Like and, uh, the fact that, I mean, that you can, uh, there's, even in microbes, like before you get to complex organisms, yeah, the, my favorite example is um, I used to use a buffer solution in grad school made from a buffer called um, cacodylic acid. Um, and so cacodylic acid is this buffer that buffers at about the same pH as phosphate. So for those of you that aren't following with all the inside baseball, these buffer around neutral pH. So you add it to a react keep it at, you know, around pH seven or eight, so, you know, where biology typically works. Um, and cacodylic acid um, is actually an arsenic compound, and yet these bugs manage to grow in this concentrated cacodylic acid. You see some of the same examples where, um, you know, and, uh, if you have ever not cleaned your sink or your toilet for long enough, and you get kind of a red ring around there, there's a uh, bacterium that makes a pigment called Prodigiosin, and um, that's the red, and it makes this pigment from eating usually like soap and stuff like that in your sink. And then there's bacteria like radiodurans that live in the presence of um, you know, just incredible amounts of ionizing radiation. So, and, uh, like I said, I'm not familiar with the papers, so I don't want to completely trash it, but I feel like life on Earth is weird in ways that we understand that uh, a lot of the time you don't need to necessarily invoke a mechanism like that. But that being said, and, uh, I'm kind of receptive to the idea of panspermia, especially at the beginning, because said, uh, we really don't know how this stuff got started. And if you look at a place like Mars, where it looks like it has a lot of potential components of the same type of chemistry that we're doing here, you could imagine that, you know, and, uh, I forget who says this, I'm, I'm always plagiarizing it when I say it, but that Mars and Earth swapped spit for a long time, because there were a lot of ejecta that came out of Earth that went to Mars, vice versa. And uh, there certainly was mass exchange between these planets. and you know, even if it wasn't necessarily life forms that got exchanged, or that could be it. It could have been, you know, a hunk of rock on which some prebiotic chemistry that ultimately leaded, uh, led to life emerging, getting exchanged between the two of them. So and, uh, I, I'm definitely receptive to the idea of stuff going back and forth uh, between the two of them. But and, uh, yeah, I need to look at this octopus thing because I remember you I guys- will, uh, I will share the link just because yeah. it's one of my favorite articles of the idea that octopi and other cephalopods have such a weird evolutionary trajectory that maybe some of their dna came from space and it's only like it's it's a very small section it's section 13 of this paper but i love this paper so much um their figure five i will put it in the the chats for uh the youtube and twitch too their figure five is just amazing because it's just a picture of a squid and then a, ph a phage or a virus, and then it just goes squid uh, plus phage equals octopus. Uh, and it's it's my favorite. <laughs> That's funny. All right. That was that was off topic, but I love this paper so much. Oh, wait, you, you actually inspired another follow-up question. Uh, so someone asked to build a salad. If they have eight brains, why do we eat them and not the other way around? I think that they're there's probably something there, right? You know, I I feel like if you were to have a fight with eight chickens, they have eight brains, but I could beat eight chickens. Um, and I'm saying that as a vegan for the people on like YouTube and Twitch that are very concerned that I'm like beating up chickens. I'm not. I'm just saying I could if they wanted a fight. Um, this is almost dating myself now, but on Reddit, where they do the Ask Me Anything threads with people, that used to be like one of the default meme questions was, uh, would you rather fight a hundred <laughs> duck-sized horse or <laughs> one horse-sized duck? <laughs> I, yeah, that's, I feel like I asked a weird question, though. I'm going to let other people talk for a bit, because that was. No, weird it... questions are fun. I. I really like the idea of octopi coming from like space viruses with intelligence, but that's that's a different story. So, um, all right, where are we out in space right now? Around Kerbit, Kerbit, Ker Kerbin, Kerbin. I did again. 
No, we're going to decay into the atmosphere again. It's okay. No one is alive on that ship. That's true. But, but I got to bomb the Kerbals out. Like, I mean, if they've dedicated years or whatever their time unit is of their Kerbal lives to making the spacecraft. <laughs> gotta think of them, too. Uh, I guess, I guess I could save back to where it was before I could, tr or I could try to keep going from where I am. Um, so I built, I burned radial out, so maybe if I burn radial in somewhere else, that'll work? Let's see if that helps. I don't know. I wish someone knew how to help me play this game. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I think this is the thing with Animal Crossing, I think everyone can tell us to do things, but with Kerbal, I think... Not as many people can tell us exactly how to fix everything. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. from your little globe there in the middle, are you trying to keep like a horizon? It looks like you're pointed straight at the earth now, or the water. <laughs> Wasn't there like an orange and a blue? Wait, what? <laughs> so yeah, there's like two hemispheres, right? A blue and an orange. Are you trying to keep the sort of horizon in the middle or? <laughs> oh, you mean on the nav ball? Yeah. Uh, no, that's just like. Uh, I think I think this is like. Actually, like. Um, degree heading, so it's it's not it's I'm not trying to stay toward or away from one of the hemispheres. It's I just love saying, how you are trying to be Adam without knowing probably the same amount <laughs> I do, which is nothing. Which is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see if this does something. All right, wait, wait, we're moving back up. Yay. I also might run out of fuel. All right, we're out of the danger zone now. Yay. Sorry, I am... I think... Yeah, I don't... I... Sorry. Quiet. Okay, I'm going to go try... I think we can probably also give up at a certain amount of time and have this uh, rocket just go around since there's no one in it. It can uh, it can stay in orbit for as long as it wants to. No one's gonna die. So we Jordan and I were talking about this uh, a uh, yesterday a little bit when we were practicing this a bit, but um, how much space debris is out there? right now in Kerbin, right now, Jordan. How much space have, how debris? Floating, yeah, how many things do you have floating around the Earth, or Kerbin? Uh, hang on. How much about Kerbin? So there's the this craft, that craft, and I think there's probably some, like, spare, like, empty rocket okay. fuselages that are just hanging out. I don't know if those wound up yes. floating back to Earth yet or not, but they might be there. Kerbin. Kerbin, but yeah. How much, what are the chances that there's bacterial contamination or phage or viruses on the stuff that's already in space here? And how much of that is stuff that we've introduced into space from just us? Like right now on Earth? Yeah, I think so. Knowing that? I, I, I honestly don't know the answer. I know that it's enough that people are worried about it and it's it's a concern and people discuss it. And this is something I keep coming back to with the space flight stuff where I feel like this is a field where a lot of people interact with people from quite a few different fields and you kind of become a generalist in a lot of stuff and um, it's, uh, no one has all the answers to this kind of thing. So and, uh, I do know that's something that yeah people worry about, they talk about mission design, but it's not, uh, I think, kind of a red alert thing going off on people's radars. So, and um, you wonder how much it's going to become an in increasing problem because and, uh, one thing that comes up when people are talking about space flight is that a lot of people have kind of a favorite celestial body that they're talking about. You know, we talked about Mars a lot here and uh, Titan and other planets. And obviously the consequences that you of uh, sending more craft to a certain body is there's going to be all the associated debris with it and you know we went to the moon multiple times we've gone to mars several times and, you know just just this summer there were three launches uh in the last month or so and so and uh it certainly becomes i think an increasing problem and and part of mission design and 
there's obviously the, just like you would think about on Earth, if you're talking about whether you're landing a spacecraft uh, in the Pacific Ocean or in China or in the US, not even in the US, you know, Florida versus Alaska or something like that. There's different concerns for different parts of the planet. So it, I would say I know enough to know that that certainly becomes a consideration and they're talking about, you know, you don't want to crash one thing into the other thing unless you mm -hmm. need to crash the one thing into the other thing. But uh, um, it's, uh, I'm not sure specifically about the kind of general space to free question. Well, I'm just curious about it just because I wonder how much, I remember there was a story, I think from, I want to say it was last year, but it might have been longer ago because my mind is a mess because of COVID, um, that there was a spacecraft that landed on the moon and let out a bunch of tardigrades on the moon. Um, and so I wonder how much with the space debris, if there are organisms that are just being released and is there something to be learned about taking life from Earth and introducing it to the moon just to see what evolution would look like in a different environment in terms of space? Yeah, and I think it's an incredibly interesting question. And it's one of those things where uh, the, it, it comes up. Again, I keep coming back to the teams. This is These missions are assembled by a bunch of people with that are different constituencies with different priorities. And it's undeniable that it's a really interesting question about what would happen if you had lineages of bacteria or tardigrades or anything and evolve them for many generations on another body. But then that's kind of mutually exclusive with the forward contamination question that I mentioned. And so it, uh, it's one of these things where it, I feel like space flight almost more than anything else kind of emphasizes the fact that science is this uniquely human enterprise where it, uh, there's competing constituencies that are going into this with different priorities, and a lot of the time they're mutually exclusive. And then recognizing that in the end, sending something to Mars and learning something about Mars is better than not sending something to Mars and learning about Mars, but you ultimately decide what you have to do, and it becomes, yeah, kind of one of those questions about uh, deciding between what does evolution look like on Mars or avoiding forward contamination or things like that. So uh, I, I think that definitely touches on the types of discussion that happen. And uh, the, that kind of relates to, in terms of forward contamination, thinking about what, if you were looking at another body, what prebiotic chemistry might look like. Because if you're seeing biological chemistry, you probably move past prebiotic chemistry and the types of contamination that you would get uh, sending biological molecules. How do you distinguish that? And that's the type of question where uh, the, I think it's one of the reasons it's so fun to talk about this stuff and work in this space. but one of the reasons it's such a hard problem to work on because uh, you have to anticipate a bunch of these uh, contingencies and work around things that you know may or may not be a problem and you're operating in a space where the person that you're working closely with, they may have very different interests than you about uh, what type of information we're trying to get from these missions. So we all got to get along. Yeah. It, it just, it also brings up that concept of, um, I think it's, it's familiar in physics, and I think it's in archaeology, too, with how much of the science itself is destructive towards, like, archaeology is inherently destructive. If you do archaeology, you are, to an extent, destroying what's already there. With physics, if you're observing uh, things within the, the quantum realm, the observation changes it a bit. And so how much is us looking for uh, life potentially adding it to it as well, which I think I just talked myself into a little confusion. <laughs> so uh, in the in game, I have messed up again, and <laughs> we are now out of fuel and descending into the atmosphere. So should we just maybe end this on the watch? And we also don't have a parachute because we were not supposed to come back down. So should we just watch the fiery collapse of this uh, of this? Kerbalist uh, expedition, thankfully. Do you want me to go grab my uh, um, bugle and play taps real quick? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> <laughs> All no right. Let's just watch. Twenty appropriate. Let's just watch this decay into the app. Okay, it's gonna. Oh, we're you on the dark side of Kerbin, so it's gonna be hard. We'll just. It's gonna be hard to see. It'll look like a shooting star for the people on the dark side of Kerbin. Mm hmm All right, it should be starting to heat up anytime soon. I feel like my neighbors would be very angry if I went and got my trumpet. 
So guys, if you're on YouTube, you can switch to Twitch. You're going to see the crash first. We're a little further in the future on Twitch. <laughs> that is a good call. And there are, there are a couple of us on Twitch watching. We're seeing some really impressive flames on Twitch, and it's just getting started on YouTube, guys. Oh, this is sad. <laughs> Curb man. Just watching it burn up. May no, no, it's uh, definitely gonna burn up. I was about to say maybe we'll see it crash into the into, but no, it's definitely gonna explode. I think this is the most the best possible on brand for 2020 ending to something like this. <laughs> oh, just it completely exploding. Right. At least no Kerbals were armed. It hasn't crashed yet. Wait, no, it's it's it made it through the atmosphere. It didn't. Ex hmm. I guess the heat rating for that was very. So I guess now it's just gonna ex like crash into the. Do Do you know where it's gonna land? Is it gonna be in the curb ocean or curb land? The curb the curb the curb ocean. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it looks like the ocean. It's Wait, hard, kind of hard to tell. Window. That's not a Kerbal in the window? No! <laughs> Please don't let there be a Kerbal in the window. It usually shows up on the side if there are Kerbals, and there are... There's Do you have a no Kerbal crew. radio for this? <laughs> What's that? Is there a Kerbal graveyard? Yeah. Like, where, where do we honor the, the Kerbals of the past? This has gotten very morbid. I'm worried about that guy in the window. I want to know what that is. Was guy there a the... guy in the window? I didn't see a guy in the There's window. There's not a guy in the window. I think you're what? looking at the thrusters. Okay. I'm... okay I thought there that are some so... RCS thrusters oh. there. False alarm, guys. This is... That no, made me so bad. Hard. All right. We're about to crash. I looked away from... Uh... Oh, it's going down to... in the kilometers until impact. You know what? Let's just send it oh. down. Oh. <laughs> you know what? It's going to make a really great beginning of a sea station. Because really, we haven't explored under the ocean of Kerbal. I mean, it enough. could also just be uh, like start. Well, I don't know how close we are to the shore, <laughs> but if we're, it could be like a reef. I, I salute you, kind of Kerbal. Vessel is destroyed. Cannot auto save at this point. <laughs> Okay, well, how do I get out of here now? I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm just Damn, I, really, I'm really curious about the funding for the Kerbal Space Program now. Going forward, you mean like for future uh, Kerbal it, missions? Is Kerbal uh, in a country that its funding is tied to public opinion for space programs? I don't know, because I think there's a lot of like a lot of that sort of stuff. And what we talked about earlier about like the politics and like who you know and like the cost and everything like I think that has to there's a lot of that in the career mode where you actually have to like spend money on things and like get like contracts and stuff. Okay. Uh, which I am not playing. I can just do whatever the want I want right now because this is the. Okay. This is not real science, then, because there's you just, no you just have to brand it as a defense effort and right. call it a space force, and you'll get all the money you want for it. Mm. The Kerbal equivalent of DARPA. But let's let's do our post mortem like it, the, the good thing statistic. Look, we went over twelve million meters. Is that right? That, that's that, that's an achievement. Yeah, I'm I'm proud of us. Twenty two hundred sixty one meters per second. You know, it was unmanned. I'm so happy about that. I would be just heartbroken about Bob and Bill, um, which they would haunt me. So mm -hmm. I don't think Jebediah would have gotten much work done for at least a week afterwards either if he knew that his buddy got hurt from that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how... However, we do yeah. now have the problem where I have now three more days, and I guess I can just play this separately to, uh, to save... Um, Jebediah. Jebediah, exactly. Because he's so going to run out of oxygen. I have to yeah. send up another mission. You know, really, can you send up some, like, cyanobacteria or, like, uh, some plants? 
Uh, I can send up some plants. There's actually a greenhouse. For seven dia, yeah. You can send up a greenhouse. Let's let's send up some some cyanobacteria. I really think that's the best way to do this. Hmm. Just get him some oxygen that way. Not a good plan. As long as you're on the bright side of Kerbal. I think they have, like, the greenhouse at least has some uh, growing lamps. I think it's Please. not actually sun. <laughs> so is three days realistic? Can Jephediah be saved? Is it, is it, is it that? It is realistic. Um... Oh, There's no stuff. weather on Kerbal, is there? See, Bill and Bob are just fine. They did not get put into the space station. Or into the spaceship. Hey. Because I'm an idiot. Thanks um, for holding down the fort, guys. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, three days is uh, is reasonable because it really, like, the a low Kerbin orbit really only takes, like, it, not, like, in game time, because since you can speed it up, I think like an hour and a half, and you just have to adjust it the orbits a couple times. It is doable in three days. Do they rate the Kerbals on courage and stupidity? Is that what I, I saw? saw stupidity too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> is stupidity a good thing for I guess accident prone missions? As long as you're brave too. <laughs> right. And was the stupidity was, was that why they forgot to get on? Was that did they, <laughs> did they did they not get the memo? Like they got their their, their orders. <laughs> well, Bob is not very stupid. Bill has. But did Bill sleep in? Is what my question is. Is that what, what happened here? This. <laughs> I like that they say the engineer is an idiot. The scientist is very like is very low with stupidity. Like, how did they come up with this? Not very brave, though. You know, that's, yeah. Scientists are cowards. They're not very, like, uh, they're not stupid, but they're cowards. Uh, you gotta get funding, man. Courage is uh, not rewarded. Yeah, there you go. Just... Although it's uh, Justin, the third from the bottom, he's got quite a bit of stupidity and not much courage. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's an applicant. Are all the scientists lacking in courage? No. Go with Tiffle. No, but Tiffle's dumb as dumb as dumb as a rock. Yeah, but the pilot's dumber, Sanan. As uh, he's he's just about maxed out his stupidity and pretty brave though. I mean, I, what the heck are we looking at? I don't know. <laughs> I'm very concerned about the Kerbal Space Program now. I mean, if this is their 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 farm team, like that's their talent pool, and this is what we're looking at the future, I'm I'm nervous too. Um. Yeah. You have less than three days to level up the courage and ramp down the stupidity on these guys. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Um... So, weird, uh, but just, I mean, kind of left field question. What are the chances that we are going to discover life on Mars, either as a fossil or as something currently living there right now, in your estimates? So what I would say is that there are people that think we already have, and it's just difficult to actually ask those questions because some of the um, experiments that we talked about that we, uh, or that we actually didn't really get to with the, some of the early Mars missions with um, back in the 70s, we sent landers uh, with some of the Viking missions to look for signatures for microbial life. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, what they did was the type of, uh, on the surface of Mars experiments that, that uh, I was talking about. And they went through a series of four experiments and some didn't look so good, some look kind of inconclusive. And th that's still something where uh, I would say most people think that um, it was inconclusive. Some people are absolutely adamant that um, this, uh, the results that we got from them were evidence from life. Hmm. And so that's one reason I think that sample return is just so important because uh, the the results that we get from these, just because of the nature of sending all your instrumentation on the rocket, it's never going to be as conclusive as something you find on Earth. Um, I'm going to kind of hedge an answer to the question about how likely we are to find life. I would say more likely than not. 
and um, if it's not necessarily Mars um, on some other body, if not extant life, at least evidence of past life, just because of looking at the chemical environments on these planets and thinking about it from the possibility of getting sort of life as we know it. And um, it looks like there's enough favorable environments that um, and, uh, unless it was this weird, uh, you know, once in the history of the universe thing, um, which it seems like it's probably not based on a lot of the experiments people have done on the original life on Earth. I think that, um, you know, we, we had the stuff to get things booted up on other planets. You know? So what is your favorite explanation for the Fermi paradox? Just because it's getting to the end of this meeting. Let's go crazy here. Like, what's your favorite explanation for why we haven't been contacted by Klingons? Space is big, and, um, and space is hard to explore. I, I think both of those alone kind of get you a lot of the way there. And, um, you know, I think when people kind of think about that, that, um, and, uh, so yeah, for those of you that, that uh, are coming in and wondering about the Fermi Paradox thing, it's, uh, it's a lot of people, the idea is a lot of people think that there's life uh, outside Earth, but we don't really have a whole lot of evidence. Um, and yeah, my, my answer to that, why we don't really have that, is the fact that the uh, space is just so vast. Um, what constitutes life? Um, you know, most of the time, I think most scientists that are thinking about life on other planets aren't really thinking about, certainly not advanced Star Trek civilizations that are leagues ahead of where we, we, we are right now that would be, you know, doing interplanetary travel with ease and things like that. Um, the, we're thinking about way towards the other end of things that look like microbes and stuff like that, where they wouldn't really have uh, the means to do it. And then even if there is something like us, where we're, you know, if you imagine some hypothetical Star Trek civilization, and then on the other end of the spectrum is the microbes, and then we're kind of there in the middle. We, you know, we struggle to do this. Every time we have a rocket launch, we're kind of watching, biting our fingernails, watching to see whether it takes off. And even if it takes off, you know, we're doing this type of thing where, uh, you know, to get to Mars, like we were talking about earlier, we're doing this home and transfer thing where it's not like you're driving a car and you're just thrusting all the way to Mars. Uh, you're using Earth's gravity and using Mars's gravity, and it's, it's not the fuel getting you there the whole way. So just kind of considering that, the fact that, you know, we're just one solar system and how hard that is, and then weighing the fact that, you know, other life that it exists, uh, regardless of how far along it is, it's more likely to start as microbial than something else, because you have to, assuming it took something like the path that we have here, here evolve multicellularity and go through all those steps before you get to the little green man. And uh, it's those alone, at least for me, um, I think mitigate the fact that, um, you know, we're not getting transmissions from other planets or things like that. That being said, I think uh, it, it's certainly worth listening, and I'm glad we're doing that too. And so if it is microbial life on other planets and we can make a frozen yogurt with them, what space frozen yogurt flavors do you think we're going to find if it is just microbes on other planets and we can make space yogurt? Like, is it going to be more lemony than you think than what we have here for space yogurt? Yeah, probably the fruit flavors first. I also think that um, space kombucha would be a big thing too. Uh, uh, the, the... I can market that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like if, if Shaitan Bio, instead of going the synthetic biology route, decides to go astrobiology route, we need to be selling space kombucha. The Mars booch. There you go. It's... Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's something. <laughs> All right. Well, we probably start winding down, though, too, because we had A, almost accidentally killed some Kerbal. Uh, and B, we're quickly approaching nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we could start to wind down. Um, if anyone, we could see if anyone um, in the, either chat has any like final questions. If there's anything, Aaron, you wanted to say before we end end on this? Oh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, and, uh, I, I I'm glad no kerbals were harmed, and I think this this was a really fun discussion. No kerbals were harmed in the making of this live stream. Thank you so much for doing this, Aaron. This was so silly at some points, and I thank you so much for putting up with us. No, this is fun. I mean, I, I feel like kind of like what we were talking about with diagnostics and vaccine. And, um, this is something that people, especially in academia, have 
talked about for years, the fact that we have this travel culture that isn't so great for families, it's certainly not great for the planet, and it's one of those things where you talk about it at every meeting, but it's just sort of the reality that for career reasons, you know, people go and give talks and things like that, and they say, we really should have more virtual meetings, and it, you know, it happened to some extent, but we really were never kind of forced to embrace it because of circumstances until COVID. And so and, uh, it's one of those bright side things where I certainly don't wish we were in this situation, but I feel like and, uh, people are more receptive and inclined to do stuff like this uh, kind of in the environment that we are. So and, uh, mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is that I'm, I, I'm glad we set the purple spacecraft up today and, and uh, COVID was no <laughs> doubt part of that. <laughs> All right, well. Well, with that said, we should probably start shutting things down. So thank everyone for coming. Thank you so much for talking with us. I know I just said that, Aaron, but I just, I can't say it enough. Yeah, uh, thank you, Aaron. This has been awesome. Uh, random, completely random at times. Lots of <laughs> COVID, uh, Kerbals, et cetera. It's been a tremendous honor to, to have you on this call. And, chatting about astrobiology. I think this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in and uh, oftentimes just, like don't know where to start. So uh, hopefully we've, uh, you know, talked about some interesting things and anybody that's in our community, you know, you guys know where to find us at Stride Town Bio on Twitter, on Instagram. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we have a Slack channel. And if you want access to that, just hit us up at shytownbio at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody for joining us, and especially to Aaron. Thanks, guys. This was a lot of fun. And, uh, if you're following Shedtown on Twitter, um, you can see in their recent tweets my contact information, too. So if you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out. I will retweet you right now. All right. All right I'm going to sign off then. All right. Thank you guys so much, and have a good night. All right. Thanks, thanks all. Thanks a lot.